Never before has mankind stood this close to the reality of true brotherhood. Since the defeat of the Arab Alliance in Russia, we have worked diligently to stabilize the peace we have won on the battlefield. Colonel Ferguson? Yes, Colonel Campbell, how are you? A little tired. What's, uh, what's that all about? What's what all about? The uh, girl on the speaker. Oh, that's Angela Company, a kind of computerized disc jockey with sex appeal. Quite versatile, really. She translates computer language into a form that we can understand. And she plays music that fits the mood of any given situation. Does she always play marches? Well, these aren't exactly waltz times, Colonel. Quite right. By the way, how are things up there? Well, life goes on. People are still afraid, but they don't know what they were afraid of. Well, perhaps it'll pass. Madness always has. Hopefully. Is there anything I need to know? What about the uh, Chinese? No, it's all in the reports, but uh, when you get down there, check with Lieutenant Baldry. He can lay it all out for you. Fine. Lieutenant Baldry. Right. Well, uh, I guess that's it. That's it? All right. Thank you, sir. Good luck. Thank you. decided you're a better operations officer than the last one we had. That man had no imagination at all. None at all. He always kept trying to tidy up things. You play chess? Yes, but it's, it's been some time since I've played. Excellent, excellent. I see you put in for early retirement. 
Why is that, Colonel? Well, uh, I'm sorry, sir. They are personal reasons. There are no personal reasons. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's the reason. What is it the man says? The only two proper uniforms on Earth are the uniform of Rome or no clothes at all. What do you think of the man? Well, if he's what he claims to be, the peacemaker, then there's no need for any more soldiers. If he's not what he claims to be, then I've no need for him at all. It's just that simple. I suppose you're wondering where the missiles are. Yes, when I was briefed, I was told I was to be assigned to a missile silo. I must have been dozing or something. We have no red phones or hotlines or buttons to push, Colonel. No. Nothing to blow up or to destroy. No doomsday machines. Look around you. What do you see? Looks to me like a mess. Why is it that operation officers always want to tidy up? Look, Mr. Tolman. Never mind. What you see, but apparently don't perceive, are ideas. Cervantes, Marcus Aurelius, the entire drawings of Chardin. What do you think happens to the ideas and literature and art of man when they bomb his museums? What do you think happened to Michelangelo's Bacchus when the National Museum in Florence was bombed last year? Or to the priceless treasures when the Vatican went up in smoke? Why are you so upset with me? I didn't do those things. I'm not upset with you, Colonel. I'm just trying to define your assignment. Now, after the destruction of the Vatican and the bombings in Florence, it seemed as though World War III was inevitable. Now. That was before the man took power. And there were those, including the Club of Rome, and a large number of scientific and cultural societies throughout the world who became quite concerned about saving the great works of mankind, the literature, the art, the artistic expression, scientific thought, because we all knew what enormous damage the next war could bring. So. We decided to store all the cultural treasures into the memory banks of computers and then bury those computers beneath a mountain where they would be safe. This took many years, but now it's nearly all here. The accumulated knowledge and wisdom and artistic expression of an entire civilization called Earth. Follow me, Colonel Ferguson. Yes, I, I think so. And if the final war does occur, and it seems to be building up now, then this treasure is here, where the survivors can pick up the pieces. And we won't have to begin again as savages. If the final war occurs, we're savages already. Strange words for a military man. Well, I suppose so. Well, the assignment is obvious. We're curators of a sort. Curators for the Museum of Man. Don't you see, Colonel? It's almost as if we were the... How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Please recheck Circuit 9, Environmental System Alpha. I love thee to the depth... His car's checked out that circuit yet. Yeah. Well, tell him to take time. Ne never mind, I'll tell him myself. Come along, Colonel. I'll show you around. All right. Thank you. I don't know. Here, this place is crawling with computers and genius. And I can't get a simple mechanical repair on System Alpha. We can live without computers and genius, but without air. We're all going to die. So it's your responsibility to keep things running. I hope you're better at it than your predecessor was. No imagination at all, that man. 
none at all. Colonel Ferguson, Lieutenant Baldry. Lieutenant? The most imaginative recreation officer in the Roman Empire. Uh, well, this uh, place is full of surprises. It's uh, not exactly your ordinary run-of-the-mill missile silo. <laughs> Try your luck? Uh, thank you, no. I'll pass. I've been uh, practicing up to be Tallman. He's a crack shot. Really amazing. Nobody's been able to beat him yet. I don't know how he does it. Hmm. I wasn't always a scholar. Oh? What were you? You won't tell. Why not? Personal reasons, Colonel. <laughs> Personal reasons. <laughs> Shall we go? Certainly. Okay. Lieutenant? is how we store literature in the memory banks. But the really exciting problem we faced was this. How do you store a three-dimensional object, say the winged victory of Samothrace, into a computer memory bank? Well, some sort of numerical photography? Well, that's close. But actually, the solution was nothing new. You see, with the use of the laser beam and holographic memory techniques, we can actually photograph, store, and recall three-dimensional images. Yes, but doesn't it take an awful lot of room to store all of this? Not as much room as you might think. You see, with holography, we can increase the density of the stored information perhaps a thousand times. For instance, all the great Renaissance sculpture can be stored in an area no larger than my fist. And as for architecture, well, the cathedral at Reims, for example, can be stored in an area no larger than the head of a pin. Hmm. Something's coming in on the line. Perhaps we should be moving on. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I think the world will end in fire. Chinese? Wait, uh, they're confirming. We call this the arena. You might call it a box seat at the world game. It's like watching chess played by maniacs. It's just more troop movements. Chinese infantry through Kashmir, along the, uh, the roads they started building in the 70s. What's the, uh, what's the object of all this? The object? Merely to watch. Watch what? The world. Events. The very nature and purpose of surveillance is to be able to react to the situations being observed. Ah, uh, the military man. But you have no way to react, and to me this is senseless. It's not much different than life, is it? We're all powerless, really. We can't affect the forces that we see controlling our lives. For instance, you don't want to wear that uniform, but you are wearing it. No, Colonel, we merely watch the world game. And you know something? I think the game is about over. Thanks to all the people in the world who wear uniforms and claim they don't want to. I think the game is about to be called on account of darkness. It's been a busy day. I think I'll turn in. Oh, Colonel, think of the world situation as a chess game. Now, in the old days, the campaigns moved very slowly. The pawns moved one square at a time. But today, the rules are much different. 
All the pieces have enormous power. The Chinese, the United States of Europe, all the nations. It's as if each of these chess men were suddenly empowered with the move of a queen. Life is a little more complicated than chess. Allow me, Colonel. Now, in a game where all the pieces have such a limited power, two things would happen. First, the game would be remarkably swift. It would be over almost as soon as it started. And second, only one piece would be left on the board. And the game was done. Frankly, Tom, I'm getting just a little tired of your smug analogies. What wonderful. Excellent, Colonel. I knew you'd do. A little personality conflict to spice the end of days. Good night, Tosh. Good night, Colonel. Oh, Colonel, if you'll allow me one more of my smug analogies. One day you may have reason to thank me. I intend to be left on the board. There is nothing in nature more evident than order. The marching of the stars across the universe. The migration of birds. The movement of the tide. A star which strays burns up. A bird which fails to... Good night, Colonel. Uh, yes, good night. A ship which ignores the tide is lost. Therefore, order is its own law. Any act or thought to the contrary must surely be punished. <laughs> Just as a star that wanders from its appointed place in the heavens will disappear. Come in. Everything okay? No, not really. Yeah, I know. Lieutenant, you've been in this installation quite some time. Uh, what's with this fellow Tallman? Well, he's a brilliant man. As far as I know, he's just got one flaw. He's insane. Well, in the morning, I'll, uh, I'll show you operations reports. Have a good night, sir. Thank you, Lieutenant. I suppose. No, it's the craziest thing. The Euphrates seems to be gone. That's some sort of a ship? No, the river. The Euphrates just isn't there anymore. It's just uh, diverted. It was dried up or something. Lieutenant, are you sure you're talking about the Euphrates River? Now nothing stands between the Chinese and the West. If they wanted to invade, a river wouldn't stop them. Right. It's not a physical barrier. The Euphrates has always been more of a cultural, even a psychological barrier between East and West since the beginning of time. A river that size just doesn't disappear. It doesn't? Then how do you explain the fact that the Nile was diverted? Well, that was a foul up in engineering. When they, when they built the Aswan Dam, they blew it. Well, the point remains. There are 200 million Chinese moving through Tibet and Kashmir. The first units are reported here, on the east bank of the Euphrates. And with the Russian-Arab Confederacy destroyed, there's nothing to stop them. And here, here and here, the armies of the Roman Empire move eastward, from America, from Europe. While everyone is talking about peace in our time, their actions are making peace impossible. It's a curious thing. Look where the lines intersect. Hmm. Megiddo. 
plain of Jezreel. More armies have fought there than probably any other place on Earth. Since time began, that piece of land, that tiny piece of land has been like a, like a magnet, drawing opposing armies together and then destroying them. Maybe that's why that piece of land is also known as Armageddon. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, that the way might be prepared for the kings of the east. I love you. I love you. I love you. If it seems harsh that these measures regarding worship be employed, consider the reasoning behind them. There is but one earth. The air that man breathes is the same for all men. The joy or pain in the heart of all men is the same for each man. So then how can one who preaches that there are different religions be considered a religious man? Liberty is like a diamond. In order for it to have lasting beauty, you must do without it for a while. For only the gifted expert can properly polish it and prepare it for the day when it will be returned to you in its most perfect form. Ever wonder how we pulled it off? The man? The Roman Empire. The United States of Europe. How many people since Caesar have tried to revive it and failed? Charlemagne for one. Napoleon. Hitler. Yeah, but the man succeeded where all the others failed. You know, I don't understand how it happened. Well, it was just a freak of history. The world had been fighting so long it was falling apart. Then along came a man who spoke gently about possibilities, promise. He was like a cool breeze on a hot day. If you, uh, if you had it to do over again, would you follow him? I've thought about that. I don't know. I know there's something wrong, terribly wrong, somewhere. People, people keep dying. But uh, he's all we've got corner pocket. of Jerusalem, then the big stuff. Check the radiation topside. Just traces. Nothing dangerous, but it's there. I just don't believe it. Just a matter of time. The exchange of queens. Perhaps the world we knew up there was merely an illusion, the shadow of something. And the reality is here, in the computers. It's all here, you know. Everything really worthwhile. Except the people. Maybe the people were merely tools God used to create art. And now that his art has been safely tucked away, man is obsolete thrown away like an old pair of pliers. 
What do you think it's like up there? Like Hiroshima? All over, everywhere? I just don't understand. There was to be peace. The man said there was to be peace. The man. Nobody's perfect, Baldry. Do you know something? Every war since the beginning of time was fought to win peace. The peacemaker. Hmm? Every war is the war to end all wars. <laughs> sure is admission for a military man. <laughs> As ranking military officer of the world, I hereby disband all the armies. A little late, isn't it? Do you know something, Tolman? You really know how to get me angry. What I make you feel isn't anger at all, Ferguson. It's guilt. <laughs> knows what's happened up there. The situation down here is this. The archive computers are in good condition, but no damage to the power supply or to the circuitry. They should function indefinitely, just as they were designed to function. So, I guess you might say that our little mission here is complete. The Museum of Man, as Mr. Tallman would put it, is safely intact. There is one problem. Circuit 9, environmental systems alpha, responds negatively. I told you to fix that days ago. Carch, can you fix it? No, I'm afraid not. You see, the problem is not with the power supply, the circuitry. It's with the air vents to the surface. When the mountain shifted, the air vents were sealed. We'll fix that. We can't fix that. We'd have to move the mountain. How much air do we have left? Seven days. Well, what about the elevator shaft? There is no more elevator shaft. Gosh. What you are trying to tell us is... is that it's over. Well, we can't get out. And there's probably... Nobody left to get in. Seven days. Here we are. 
are sitting on the wisdom of the ages. And we can't even fix a simple ventilator system. Tigress. Einstein. Right at our fingertips. And we're all going to die. <laughs> because they never worked on ventilators. Why didn't you fix it when I told you to, Cars? Just didn't count on the city, old man. You can accept the end of the world with a, with a smirk, but you just can't accept your own death. You heard me, Ferguson, that first day you came. I told him to check out the system. He deliberately refused. Listen to that fool out there. Playing his witless game. Unknowing. Uncaring. <laughs> Unfeeling. Blessed are the ignorant. Blessed are the ignorant! Oh, I'm sick and tired of listening to you. Oh, no. going on inside people. I guess he felt it worse than any of us. I didn't even know his name. His name was Tom. I wonder how many times I've looked down at guys like this. thinking about the letter to their families. I guess I won't have to worry about it this time. What'll we do with them? There's no place to bury them. Doesn't matter, we're all buried already. children? Three. I guess they were asleep. Hope so. All tucked in and safe. June was, uh, probably cleaning up a mess they made. Not a very noble note to end on. Yeah. Cleaning up a mess or taking out the trash or something. Have you got a family? No. No children, thank God. We couldn't have any. What's your wife's name? paid for. <laughs> Laura probably wrote the last check the day I left. 
seems like I've been paying on that car my whole life. And now I own it free and clear. How about that? Yeah, it's really good news. <laughs> I got some better news, you know what? What? My car's not paid for. <laughs> of tongue and pen. The saddest hour it might have been. What happened to all the dreams we had? All only those things which parallel the mood or reality of a given situation. Unfortunately, there just hasn't been much poetry or music written about nitrogen warfare. Mm. Sort of left us speechless. <laughs> You know something? I've been thinking. What was it she said that night about the, uh, the Euphrates and the kings of the East? From the Bible. Book of Revelation, I think. Yeah, well, that's uh, poetry, too, I suppose. Frankly, I've been thinking about that myself. Just can't seem to get it out of my mind. Try to discard it, but it keeps coming back like an echo. I'm not sure I follow. Now, are you familiar with the Christian Bible, especially the uh, Hebrew prophecies of the Old Testament? No, not really. Well, it seems to me that all of this that's happening to us has been foretold. So we're uh, reliving a novel we all read a long time ago. You don't sound like a man of science. Curiosity. It's the very foundation of science. So I've been working on a way to check it out with Angela. Check what out? I don't know, John. Maybe it's just a way to invest the time we've got left. I don't know why you should ask me. Ask the Colonel. He's the big power around here. Do anything you like. What do you think, John? Well, there are some interesting parallels. I mean, between secular and biblical history. I don't think I'd be much help, though. We've got the computers, though, and all the research information we'd ever need. We could begin with the thesis that the prophecies of the ancient Hebrews were accurate. That the war up there was Armageddon. The great war foretold at the end of days. Maybe we could start with that thesis and see if Angela could support it with evidence. Absurd. More witness gained. Don't say for a minute that I believe it. I just think it's an interesting experiment. Well, you're the scientist, but personally, I find the whole concept of prophecy, original sin, God's punishment of man for his disobedience, oh, I just can't buy any of it. Even if you could prove it, I still wouldn't accept it. But God is that kind of a God. He can have him. John, I'm not asking you if you believe in God or not. I just think it's something to do. Call it therapy. Thomas? Look, we could use your help. You know this museum better than anyone else. How about it? Why not? It's better than pinball. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your predecessors have stored up till this shall be carried away to Babylon. Isaiah 39, 6. Of course. Have Angela Scan Gibbons rise and fall. The Annals of Tacitus, Summa Theologies by Aquinas, Part 1 and Part 2, Aristotle on Prophesying, The Nature of Things by Lucretius. Try these for a start. Oh, also, parallel data from the prophecy. This whole land shall be a waste and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. The prophet Jeremiah. Hold it. What was that seventy years thing? Have Angela run the prophecies back through? 
and this whole land shall be a waste and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. It's really weird. Look. Seventy years checks out with all my references. The Babylonian captivity ended in 538 B.C. Belshazzar was killed in 539. Then Cyrus came to power and released the Jews. Anybody want any coffee? Get some coffee, will you, Baldry? Yeah. Colonel? Uh, yes, uh, Baldry. Black, please. What have you got, Colonel? Well, I, I, I think it's significant that Isaiah predicted Cyrus by name. He also predicted that Cyrus would set the Jews free. When? Well, that's what's interesting. According to this, Isaiah's prediction was made long before Cyrus was born. Isaiah was born in 760 B.C. The secular scan reveals his last known activity in 701. But Cyrus came to power in 539. That was nearly 200 years after Isaiah died. How could he have known? You guys still on the Babylonian captivity? Well, maybe the prophecy was just a good guess. No, I just ran a probability model on the predictions of Isaiah and Jeremiah. They were impossible guesses, right on target. Hmm. Well, what do you think, Carson? Well, I know what I know. Isaiah and Jeremiah made complex predictions about the future history of their people. And the parallel scans proved that they were accurate in precise detail. It's really wild. Well, I think we should move on. We need the prophecies dealing with the second great persecution. the winds of Rome. For there will be a great distress upon the land, and wrath to his people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and will be led captive into all nations. Karsh, have Angela scanned the military campaigns of Rome, first in early second century, especially the legions commanded by Titus. Listen. What is it? I think there's somebody up there. Oh, go to sleep, Solomon. There's nobody there. How many days left? Car said about four. There's somebody up there. Probably the wreckage on the elevator. It's a swinging cable. It's I tell you, Ferguson, there's somebody up there trying to get us out. I can feel it. According to the prophecies, the Middle East crisis was to escalate and still it erupted into thermonuclear war. Oh, now you're reaching, Karsh. They don't say that. Reaching? Listen to Angela. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is rent asunder. The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers like a drunken man. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants. The inhabitants of earth are scorched and few are left. From the prophet Isaiah.
I call that thermonuclear war. Could be. You know it could be. Well, work backwards, then. When did the crisis begin? 1948. Re-establishment of the state of Israel. Miracle of history. Couldn't happen, but it did. And the prophets all agree that that event is the key to future world history. But that's history. A lot of weird things happen in history. Take Vietnam, for example. It's, it's a miracle of history those people held out as long as they did against the greatest powers on Earth. But the fate of Israel was foretold and after 2,000 years of dispersion and persecution, they returned to their homeland. It was impossible, but Israel was reborn, just as the prophets claimed it would be. In the latter years, you shall go against the land that is restored from the ravages of the sword, where people are gathered out of many nations upon the mountains of Israel. The Book of Ezekiel. Do you think we ought to consider rationing this stuff? I'm afraid that won't be necessary. Yeah. I'm glad someone is thinking about reality. Frankly, I got so carried away with our little project, I forgot all about him for a while. What reality? Escape, of course. Survival. I'm convinced someone's trying to dig us out. The sounds are coming closer. And if we plan carefully and, and reasonably, we can escape. At least some of us can. Now, who do you think's up there, Tolman? <laughs> We've been the victims of our minds. All that we think has happened hasn't really happened at all. There's been no war. So are we, Captain? It's unthinkable. Don't do this to us, Tolman. Please don't do this. God knows, I don't want to die. I've been listening to the sounds. And by their progress so far, I calculate they'll be here in a week. In a week, we'll all be dead. We don't have to be. Now, wait a second. Wait a second. I just don't like the sound of this. Quite simple, really. We have four days of air left. Now, if two of us stop breathing, we have eight days of air. I think I've lost my appetite. How about cleaning up the table, Talman. Garbage, you'll find, is reality, too. Now, the prophets speak of four great powers that are to arise at the end of days. First, the kings of the north. The northern commander, according to Ezekiel, is the prince of an ancient people called Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Sounds like an advertising agency. Angela scanned the writings of uh, Josephus and Pliny and Herodotus and came up with a curious fact that these people, these tribes, are the direct forebears of the modern Russians. So you think the kings of the north is Russia? I don't think it. I believe it. The computer demands, I believe. That's, uh, that's interesting, Kosh. Continue, please. Uh, Daniel talks about the kings of the South, the Arab Confederation. Then he goes into great detail about how the kings of the North and the kings of the South will unite against Israel. Karsh, are you sure you're not reading things into the scriptures that aren't really there? I mean, I grew up in the church, and I never heard any of this. It's all there in black and white. But did the prophets predict the reestablishment of the Roman Empire then? Now, well, according to Angela, Daniel did. He uh, predicted the rise of Babylon and Persia and Alexander the Great, and then the division of Alexander's empire into four parts when he died. Now, after Babylon and Persia and Alexander, 
He also predicted the rise of a fourth kingdom, the uh, a ten-nation confederation that was to rise out of the ruins of the old Roman Empire. Now, again, that's history. The uh, new Roman Empire, as we know it today, the ten common market countries. So we have Russia, the Arab Confederation, the new Roman Empire, and the kings of the East, China. Right. Now, these are the four powers that the prophets predicted. Powers that were to confront each other at the end of days. The rise and fall of these countries was predicted over 2,000 years ago. We've watched it all come together in our lifetime. Russia and the Arabs confront Israel. And then Russia turns on the Arabs. And then Rome mobilizes against Russia. And China marches against the new Roman Empire. Well, that, uh, that brings us right up to date. Well, not quite. You see, the prophet said that the fuse to the last great war would, would not be a nation, but a man. The last piece of the puzzle. The beast. Beast? While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. From the book of First Thessalonians. Gentlemen, we are living Armageddon, an event that makes history and prophecy inseparable. The final... <laughs> you a chance? You heard me, Ferguson. I very clearly stated a plan. You remember, Colonel. Listen, I, I got a right to live. Please come out where I can see you. I'll, I'll give you another chance. Well, it looks like you got your extra day of air, Tolman. But now? What shall we do with you, Tolman? Hang you? Lock you up for life? Listen. They're coming, you know. You know something? It's funny. 
I never realized how futile punishment can be. Why lock him up when we're all locked up anyway? Why impose death when we're already set? Yeah, we can't just let him go. Why not? Look at him. Put caution with the boy. We won't be needing the rifle anymore. Bring it to the supply room and let me have the key back. They're coming, you know. They could, they're coming to set us free. Harder to breathe. Yeah, I know. Have you ever been diving? Scuba gear? Uh -uh. There's this place Laura and I used to go. Off Yucatan. Beautiful place in the world. It's a reef called um, Palancar. Sea, sea is so clear. It's like it's like being suspended in glass. You go down, say a hundred feet, and when you stand on the top of that reef, it's like floating the edge of the world. Whew. Just, just blue. Nothing, just blue. Once I ran out of there, and I was on a reserve tank, and uh, I remember it got harder and harder to breathe like now. And I remember almost wanting to slip off into that that deep blue forever. I've been thinking about Karsh. What do you think he was going to tell us? That, uh, that last factor in the equation. I guess we'll never know. It all makes sense, John, you know? Everything was foretold. John. After all this, do you believe Jesus was who he claimed to be? I guess that's what it all boils down to. Prophets were right about everything else. They must be right about Jesus. I want to. I really would like to believe, but... You know, when I was young, I... I was an enlisted man. You know that, Baldry? Private. I was stationed in Orleans. And every weekend I would I would take that train to Paris. Mmm, when I hit Paris, I'd head straight for Pigau. 
just two days of earth, women, booze. I met this girl there. Her name was Josette. And I remember, well, she was a prostitute, really. But I was young. To me, she was a princess. Well, anyway, on a Sunday morning, I'd have spent all my money, and I'd, I'd have this, ooh, terrible hangover. Feeling awful out in the street, lonesome, alone, and... And all of a sudden, I'd hear that great, big, booming bell. Sacre coeur. Way up there in Montmartre. And I could... I could see all the people in their beautiful clothes. Winding their way up the hill to that... Great, big, white cathedral. And I'd, I really wish I could be with him. But I was beat. Beat right down to my socks. Blue, broke, stunk, sorry, feeling sorry for myself. I smelled bad. And, and I felt guilt. Not fit for sacrifice. So I'd sell my shaving kit to some poor Algerian and take a cab across town to Notre Dame. I remember I'd, I'd climb up to the tower to the roof. And I'd sit up there. And of the city with the gargoyles. You see, Baldry, I felt at home with the demons, but not with Christ. But I think that's what it's all about, John. Jesus died so we wouldn't have to feel all that guilt. I still feel it, Baldry. I think Tallman is right. It's our guilt. Each of us is a part of everything. We're all responsible for the wrong man does. Yeah, I don't know. I wish Karsh were here. I think he knew.
How? I guess his heart just stopped beating. John. It's embarrassing. I thought maybe fear. It's not. It's just embarrassing. Like not being able to control your bowels. Helpless. Like a child. What is? Dying. I feel like throwing a tantrum. Maybe then they'd let me go play. Don't go gently into that good night. that happened. Down here. Karsh. Where does it lead? I don't know. Not for sure. I... Jesus is coming home. For a thousand years. Do you believe that? sound stopped days ago. No sound. There was... There wasn't any sound. I know. It was vanity. The sound. The desire to do what God can do. The need to control our own destiny. Sound was the voice of vanity. No different than the voice of the man. We followed the man because we couldn't find God. Baldry. Who is the man? Vanity. I'm tired, John. The cards. The equations. Gosh. It's a curious thing. Look where the lines intersect. Baldry, help me. I get the feeling that all of this, all of that's happening to us, has been foretold. Angela was scanning for the missing fact. It's so simple, boy. The scar. I don't know how we missed it. Everything else could have been coincidence. But not this. I... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems upon its horns 
and a blasphemous name upon its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Yeah, but the man succeeded where all the others failed. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth followed the beast with wonder. Men worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? which makes history and prophecy inseparable. predicted that the feud to the last great war would not be a nation, but a man. This calls for wisdom. Let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. The mark of the beast! The mark of the beast! The man! If the prophets were right. 
right about everything else. They must be right about Jesus. I love you. I love you. 